What's up, guys? It's Tony Holiday, and welcome to my absolute zero beginner's course for people getting started with Logic Pro. If you know nothing about music, music production, or Logic Pro, the software, this is the right place for you because what I'm going to be doing is breaking everything down from scratch if you've never opened Logic Pro before to helping you create your very first song. This course is going to go over how to get started on your journey as a music producer, whether you're trying to make it a career or if you're just trying to take it more seriously as a hobby or it's something that you're just doing completely for fun. This course is for you if you know absolutely nothing about Logic Pro. We're going to be going over the following topics. Basic terms and definitions that you should know as a music producer. What to do when you open Logic Pro for the first time. The layout and landscape of Logic Pro, where things are, how they work. How to start a project and start making music that you like using loops. How to take that starting point from the project and turn it into a full song. How to finish your track so it's ready to listen and share with your friends and family. And a bonus section, which is some directional advice on how to improve as a music producer. By the end of this course, you'll have a basic understanding of how a song is produced and made, how to confidently navigate Logic Pro so that you can actually build songs, and you will have your very own song that you've produced. This course is designed to be a hand-holding course for people who have never used Logic Pro. If you're already familiar with Logic Pro and have been playing around in it before, this course might be a bit slow for you. However, there might be tidbits of information for you to really solidify the foundation of music production in case you're having some issues with that. I encourage you to watch and rewatch what you need to, and you can navigate throughout this course using the timestamps down below in the description box. The last thing that I want to add is I will save the project file for this song that I'm gonna be making with you guys, and I'll make it available for download with a link down in the description. This way, if it's a certain concept that you're trying to revisit and you wanna use my project file, it's fully available to you to use for free. Download link is down below in the description. You're going to be making some progress today, and who knows, maybe it'll be the first step to something a lot bigger. But the most important thing is we take the first step, and that's exactly what this course is going to do. So with all that being said, let's get started and jump into Logic Pro and start exploring the world of music production. All right, you guys, so let's get started with the first lesson in music production and using Logic Pro. Before we actually jump into the program, I'm just gonna go over some basic terms and definitions that will really be helpful for you when it comes to producing music. This will be a really quick section, and then after this, I'm going to show you some things that you should absolutely do to get started when you first open Logic Pro. And then after that, we're actually gonna dive in and start making a song. Here are some basic musical and music production based definitions that you should know. Melody. In basic terms, melody is essentially the tune. It's what you hum back when you have a song in your head or maybe you heard a song on the radio and you keep humming it as you go throughout your day. In a more specific definition, it's a collection of musical pitches that make up a musical phrase. Drums or percussion. In basic terms, this is the beat. Maybe you've been at a family barbecue before and your Aunt Kathy has had a couple too many coolers and she starts to clap her hands to the song that's playing on the speakers. That's the beat. And in this case, especially with production, it's used by drums and percussion. That's what creates the beat or the tempo of a song. Drums are a very important part of music. They're used to keep tempo, which is the speed of the song, and also to keep other musicians and instruments in time so we can all work cohesively together. They create a basic rhythm that we can attach onto very easily. Bass. Bass is a lower frequency melody. Usually, but not always, bass is a little more simple in variation when comparing it to a regular melody in a higher frequency. Bass fills out the low frequencies of a track and helps fill up the melody spectrum. Samples. Now, the term sample and samples has taken on a lot of different definitions over the years, especially as music production has become more accessible to people. In today's terms, a sample typically refers to a pre-recorded audio piece of music, and it can be used over and over and over in new productions. This could be anything from a loop, which we'll be talking about shortly and we'll actually be using to create our song, a one shot, which is a single sound that doesn't loop over and over in a specific tempo, and also old songs that have been pre recorded and chopped up in different ways and forms to make a newer sounding song. Loops. Loops are short pieces of music, typically at a specific tempo. These can be used in your productions and are usually made by other people. And the reason why they're so popular is because you don't have to have any musical background in order to use a loop and make a production. Loops will go from start to finish, and at the finish, they'll go back to the start and loop nicely as a piece of music. A loop can be defined with any type of music, melody, drums, bass, vocals, so on and so forth. Pretty much anything can become a loop 
and is therefore a very powerful tool to use when creating music if you have no musical background or understanding. We are going to be using loops to build our track today. MIDI. Now, MIDI is actually an acronym for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. This is the technology that we use in order to write music inside of digital programs. Imagine if we wanted to create a song from scratch today without having all of the fake MIDI instruments that are in the software that we have. We would need every instrument that we want in the song in a space where we can record them. We would need to know how to play every instrument or have someone there that could play different instruments. And we would need to record them without mistakes and in the perfect tempo every time. Luckily for us, because of technology, we have MIDI. Now MIDI gives us access to almost any instrument at our fingertips. And if you don't have it stock in Logic Pro, you can usually purchase very obscure instruments that work in MIDI, and we can create different parts of a song using the same process. So if I grew up playing guitar, but I wanted to play piano, the musical theory behind each instrument is the same. However, it's hard to take your skills knowing how to play a guitar and immediately apply them to piano. MIDI actually attaches a bridge between the two, so it's the same process for each instrument. We won't be using MIDI very much in this course, if at all. However, this is something that you will definitely get used to if you want to start writing your own music. And last but certainly not least is DAW or D-A-W. And what this stands for is Digital Audio Workstation. DAW will be used as an acronym in a lot of online forums or people talking about different programs. This refers to the programs that we can use to make music digitally. And in our case, it's Logic Pro. This also refers to Ableton, FL Studio, Pro Tools, etc., etc. Any program that makes music falls under this umbrella. Those are some basic definitions, especially if you've never made music before, that you should understand and how they work. It's a way that you're going to communicate with other music producers and also talk about different parts of music when you're trying to explain things to other people or you know a track is missing a certain part. With all that out of the way, let's actually jump into the program now and we're going to go over some basic things that you should do when you first download Logic Pro and you're opening it for the very first time. So I'm simply on my desktop here, which you should be able to see because I'm screen recording now. And to open up Logic Pro, you can do this by using Spotlight or going into your applications. I'm gonna use Spotlight because it's easiest for me. So what you can do is press Command Space on your keyboard and type in Logic. This is provided that you've actually downloaded Logic Pro. So if you don't have the software, you're gonna to need to go to the App Store, purchase and pay for it, and download the actual software. I have it here, so I'm gonna click Logic Pro and press Enter on my keyboard so that I can go into the program. I'm gonna create a brand new empty project. Now, like I said, I wanna remind you, I have the project files down below in the description. So if you wanna follow along exactly what I do, you can download those. However, I encourage you to use your own brand new project because that'll give you the freedom to change certain things that maybe I've already done in there. So we're gonna go create new project, okay. And here from the very beginning, it's going to ask us to choose a track type. We're gonna to go to software instrument. However, it doesn't really matter in this case because all I'm gonna be showing you right now is how to get started when you first download Logic Pro. We're not actually gonna be making any music yet, but this is just a basic window that you'll get every time you start a new project. So let's do software instrument. This is what Logic Pro will look like as a basic blank empty project. And yours should look something similar, but you might be noticing a few differences right off the bat. However, just keep in mind that if something doesn't look quite the same, don't panic. This section is totally okay without doing any changes. There's three things that we need to do when we first open Logic Pro, especially if you wanna have all of the features available to you when opening Logic Pro. Number one, we need to download all of the additional samples and content that comes with the purchase of Logic Pro. At the time of this video, it's around 80 gigabytes, I believe. You don't have to download all of it. However, I highly recommend doing so because it gives you a ton of instrument libraries that you would otherwise have to pay money for to get, and they sound pretty good. The other reason why we need to do this is in that additional content is what's called Apple Loops. Now, Apple Loops are loops of music, like I talked about before, that we can use in our project royalty-free at no extra cost, and we can use them any way we like. We can even sell the music that we're making using these loops. So they're a very important tool, especially for getting started if you don't have any musical background. Now, here's how you can download the content. You're gonna go up to the left window here under Logic Pro, and you're gonna click that, and you're going to go down here to where it says Sound Library. Now, this little window opens up on the side, and you're going to do Download All Available Sounds. I recommend doing this typically overnight, 
The 80 gigabytes can take a while, especially if you don't have the best internet connection. And then what you can do is open it up the next day and be ready to go. I actually have all of them already downloaded, so I'm not going to do this, but this is what you should do for sure to start. Number two of the things we need to do the first time we open Logic Pro. This isn't an absolute necessity. However, it will help you out in the long run, especially when you start to accumulate lots and lots of samples and your projects start to get a lot bigger. And that is we're gonna move that sample library that we've just downloaded onto an external hard drive. If you don't have an external hard drive, that's okay. They're pretty affordable at this time. And I recommend getting something that's at least a solid state hard drive or an SSD and something at at least 500 gigabytes, I would say. That way you can move these samples over to the external hard drive, which actually eases the CPU load on your system. So as your projects get bigger and bigger and bigger, what happens is your computer actually runs the whole project file and then your sample library will be where your samples are held. So they can actually work together to even out the CPU load when you have large projects. Now it's very simple to do this. Once you have all of the additional samples downloaded, simply go back to the same menu, Logic Pro, Sound Library, and we're going to do Relocate Sound Library. Now, once you click that, it'll give you the different options as to where you can move it. I have mine actually stored on this one here, which is called Files, and that's an external hard drive that I have that I use to house all of my musical samples. Last, but certainly not least, in fact, this is probably the most important one, is we need to turn on advanced settings for Logic Pro. A lot of the capabilities that Logic Pro has aren't available right out of the box. We need to tell Logic to allow us to have those options. Now, this is how we're gonna do that. Logic Pro, Preferences, Advanced. And from here, you just have to click this box, which is Enable Complete Features, and then you can close this one up. Now, with all that being said, Let's actually jump into Logic and I'm going to start showing you where things fit in Logic and I'm going to give you a layout and the landscape of it in the next video. I'll see you in a second. In the last video, I told you about some basic terms and definitions and some general housekeeping for us to get started with the program. In this video, I'm going to show you how to navigate Logic Pro and the different areas of the program that provide different features. This is what Logic Pro looks like when you've opened up a brand new basic project. I've made a few changes, but this is what yours should look like as well. Before we get started, I'm going to close a few windows here that do come up every time you open a new project. So I'm gonna press Y on my keyboard and I, and now we have an absolute basic look at Logic Pro. What we're looking at right now is actually the arrangement window. And this is where you build or arrange your tracks. You'll have different pieces of music in all of these sections here. These are tracks which the music is played through. So when we stack new tracks on top of each other, these are gonna be all different tracks with different parts of a song. One could be melody, one could be drums, one could be bass. And we have the option to choose when they appear in the track and when they don't appear in the track. And that's what we'll play back in this section here. This is our timeline. And as you can see, when I move this marquee here, the time at the top here changes. And I can also change by the time and it'll move the marquee. So when I move this along and I press play, if there was music here, it would play back for you. This is probably where you're going to find most of your time being spent in Logic Pro. Next up, as you can see, I've made these tracks here. Well, they have something attached to them, what's called an inspector. Now I can open up the track inspector by pressing I on my keyboard. And this is kind of like the housing parameters for each of these tracks. Now you can see that these ones all here are software instruments. And what that means is that they're using MIDI. They're like the fake instruments I was talking about in the terms and definition section. We could also have a different type, an audio track. And what this one is, is actually used to record things. So if I had a microphone and I wanted to record myself singing, I would use an audio track. It's an external audio recording track. Now, as you can see, if I click this one here, which is a software instrument, and this one here, which is an audio track, some things actually change on the inspector here on the left. And that's because there's different rules and different parameters for each of the tracks. Now, a software instrument here has this little instrument dropdown, and this is where I can explore all of Logic's different plugins and different things that we can add to the track. With a recorded track, we don't have that because the sound that we're using from an audio track is actually being recorded externally. However, one thing that they do have in common is this one here, which is audio effects. And these are different effects that you're going to apply to what's actually playing back the music, whether it's a software instrument, a fake instrument in the computer, or audio, someone singing, or maybe you've recorded somebody playing guitar. 
you can add the same audio effects on top of the bass sound. Now, as you can see as well, at the top here, we have the MIDI defaults, and this is the region. So this is different parameters that we can actually apply to things if we make a software instrument track. So this is a MIDI region here. We can apply different parameters using this region inspector. In the audio region here as well, we can apply different parameters here too. It all depends on the type of track that it is. Now, what type of tracks can we actually create? Well, if I do this plus button here, this will help us make a new track. So I can click that, and these are the track types that we have for the options. I primarily use software instrument and audio track, I would say 95% of the time. Logic has a feature here called Drummer, and what this is is an algorithmic drummer that will play along with your track based on tempo, type of song, genre, et cetera, et cetera. I actually never use this feature. I haven't found it to be good enough sounding to replace the percussion or drum sounds that I want to have in a track. So I never use this. External MIDI, I wouldn't worry too much about that. That's going to be if you're actually using an external instrument, but you want to record it to MIDI. And guitar or bass is kind of like a preset for things that if you were recording an audio track that has guitar or bass. You can find the same parameters in audio, but guitar or bass actually just has more effects pre-built on top. So it can be useful in some instances, but primarily I use software instrument and audio. You can cancel this because we already have the two different types of tracks here. And I'm going to keep going with the explaining of what happens in the Logic Pro landscape here. We have two different sections open now. We have the arrangement window, which has our tracks housed. And we also have the inspector here, which is the housing for different parameters of each of those tracks. I'm going to get rid of this MIDI window here. And I'm also going to get rid of these two software instruments. The next window that I want to bring up is the library or the instrument library. And we can access this by pressing Y on our keyboard. So press Y. And this is the library here with all of the Logic instruments. As long as you've downloaded all of the additional content, you should have access to all of these. If you haven't, you might see little download icons next to these words here. That's because you need to download the additional content. And that gives you access to those sounds. A lot of people don't really like the stock sounds of Logic, but I found that if you can manipulate them right, there's actually some really great sounds in here. So we have different electronic drum kits. These are all from different eras and different genres. We have keyboards, mallets, orchestral instruments. You know, there's choirs, fake chamber choirs. We have different pianos, a Steinway grand piano, a Yamaha grand piano, so on and so forth. One of the most traditional ones that I use a lot of the time to start tracks is I'll use a Yamaha Grand Piano. So I'll go to Piano, I'll click Yamaha Grand, and as you can see here, the actual icon on my software instrument just changed. It's a piano now. It says Yamaha Grand Piano. If I grab my headphones, I can also bring up a MIDI keyboard within the software by pressing Command K, and this is a musical typing MIDI keyboard. So ASDF refers to my actual keyboard keys, but it'll play C, D, E, F on the actual musical notes. You can also move in octaves with this by pressing X to go up an octave or Z to go down an octave. The point I wanted to show you is that with this musical typing and the Yamaha Grand Piano, we now have a piano sound without having a piano anywhere in this room. Super, super helpful when it comes to us making tracks. If I wanted to change this, let's say I wanted a mallet. Let's go with marimba. Now if I play the same keys, we have the sound of a marimba. So you can already see how powerful the library section is here because you have literally a library of instruments at your fingertips to be used with MIDI. And you can add them into your track. You could have a whole orchestra with just Logic Pro and the sounds that it's given you. Pretty powerful. Another great way to explore the library is if you go up here to where it says all sounds, you can see different sound packs that they've given you. And some of my favorites that were more recently added to Logic Pro are the producer packs. So I actually really like some of the producers that they've got for Logic Pro. I really love Tom Mish, Take a Day Trip, Track Girl, Selection, Oakfelder. To be honest, I love all of them in one way or another, but you can actually click them. So if I do Selection, shout out Joe K, these are going to be the sounds that Selection made for Logic Pro to emulate their sound. So there's a different bass, there's drum kits, keyboards, Okay, if I go to take a day trip. So they have all these different sounds that they've probably used in popular songs on the charts, and you have them in your library with Logic Pro. 
Now, one thing that you won't have in the Logic Pro library is access to third-party presets. What I mean when I say third-party is I mean additional instrument libraries that you've downloaded elsewhere outside of the Apple ecosystem or Logic Pro. And to access those, what you're going to need to do is make a new software instrument and go here to where it says instrument. Now, as you can see here in my most recent ones, I have some third-party ones available. Omnisphere, Serum, Vital, Contact, Vinyl Guitar, etc., etc. You can access them in the Logic Library, but what you'll have to do is actually make it onto the track and then save it as a preset and go into User Patches and find it. I find that takes too long. Personally, I just access them with the instrument dropdown on the inspector. Moving on now, we're going to go from the left side of the screen over here to the right side. Now, what I'm going to press to start off is there's two separate windows. We're going to start with the finder, and I can press F on my keyboard, and that's going to appear on the right side there. Now, this one I typically use to find my third-party samples. If I go to all files here, you can see that I have bookmarks with my drum kits, MIDI, loops, et cetera, et cetera, things like that to help me make music faster. My suggestion to you is make a folder on your computer somewhere, call it samples or drum kits or whatever you like, and every third-party sample you get, put it in there, and then create a bookmark so that you always can access it in Logic. It's as simple as pressing F on your keyboard to get the finder. It's kind of like a browser of your computer outside of the program. And then go to this one here, which is bookmarks, which will give you all of your bookmarked folders. Really easy way for you to find the files that you need for your project without making you search for them. Other than that, you can also go to these different icons here, and that's going to explore your internal finder folder on your Mac. Now the second window that I want to show you on the right hand side here, and this one is going to be very important for us today, is called Apple Loops. And we can open that by pressing O on our keyboard. Now we have two different options here and I want you to focus on the Apple Loops section here. These are all loops that have been given to us as part of those additional content downloads. These are essential when it comes to getting started with music production, especially if you don't have a musical background, because you can sort by instrument, by genre, or by descriptor to find what you want. And it also gives you a really good idea of what certain genres sound like broken down. If you're wondering what a house drum sound like, we can go genre, house, instrument, drums, and now we have 933 samples of different house drums to give us an idea of what they sound like. If we want to do something like, I don't know, jazz drums, we can do the same thing. Go down here and we have 76 samples of different jazz drums. So it really gives you the flexibility to create any type of track you want simply by using the additional content given to you by Apple at no extra charge. Very cool. Something else I want to note about Apple Loops is these sounds are royalty free. And a lot of these samples and loops have been used in actually very big and popular songs that have been released in the past. I can't remember any of the names of them at the moment, but if you do some Google searching, I'm sure you can find it. This is the section that we're going to be using to build our track today, so we'll come back to this shortly. Now, I've shown you the majority of the features that I want to go over with you in Logic. There's a couple more that I'll show you, but we won't necessarily be using. And there's two of these. Number one is live loops. So I can close up Apple Loops, close up the library and inspector, and that's this one here. If I click that, you can see that it actually opens up kind of a separate arrangement window. Now this is Logic's version of like Ableton Live. Now it's more used for playing live using Apple's live loops feature. I never use this, or at least at this point in my career, I haven't used this. So I'm not gonna go over that. I just wanna let you know that it's here. And if you want to learn more about it, you can go on apple.com Logic Pro. It'll explain to you how to get started with using that. The other one that I want to showcase to you is the toolbar. And that's at the top here in this light gray section with this clock horlage section as well. I very rarely use the actual icons on the toolbar, which is why mine is quite bare and it might look a little different to yours. I strongly recommend you get good at using hotkeys. Hotkeys will make your workflow better, easier, faster. And once you have them ingrained, you will wonder why you weren't using them in the first place. The whole point of creating a good workflow is that so you can stay in flow state and really create the tracks that you're hearing in your head as quickly as possible, or at least get the ideas in the software as quick as possible. For that, you definitely need to learn hotkeys. But I will show you how to add certain icons and change different parameters up here because you might find other things useful that I don't. 
So to do that, you can right click the toolbar and go customize control bar and display. And these are all the different parameters that you can add to your toolbar or take away. I like a nice clean look up here, so I don't really have very much. The only thing that I have a lot of things clicked is maybe the LCD because I find these to actually be useful pieces of information that I can use. Other than that, I don't really use it. So once you've set this the way you like, you can simply go save as default, and then you can click off this, and this will open that way every time you open a new project. All right, so that was kind of a general overview of the actual software of Logic Pro. In the next video, what we're going to actually be doing is starting to build our track and taking the steps to know how to build the track that we want to build. So stay tuned for the next video and let's start making some music. As you can see here, I have just the project that we had open before. I'm actually going to delete all of these and we're going to start fresh with a brand new software instrument. And the library opened up nicely on the left side here for us to have a starting point. That's great, but we're actually not going to be using that today. So we can close that and we can press O on our keyboard to open up Apple Loops. This is where we're going to actually drag music into our arrangement window to start to build our song. Now, I know I said that we're going to be making music in this video, and I do mean that, but there is a few things that we need to get right before we start looking for loops. As you can see here in Apple Loops, there's over 30,000 different samples. So it really helps when we can narrow down what we're looking for and what kind of track we want to make before we even start looking, because that will give us a nice starting point and it will be quicker for us to actually get samples that we like into our track. Here's the best way to start a project. You need to know two things to start. Now they don't have to be this way for the whole track. You can change these later on, but it's a great starting point for you when you start looking for loops, when you start writing music. And those two things are the BPM or beats per minute. And this actually tells you how fast the track is. And the second thing is the key of the song. And this tells you which group of notes we want to kind of hang out with. Let's start with the key. Key is a variety of musical pitches that all sound good together. Remember when we talked about melody before and how it makes a musical phrase? Well, to make that musical phrase sound good, we need to use notes that are in the same key. In modern Western music, there's 12 keys, and each of those 12 keys has notes in it that fit together. The notes that fall outside of the key are out of key. Now, this is subjective. There's certain notes that are in these scales that can and can't be used based on certain parameters, but we won't get into that. Please take everything I'm saying as not as a rule, but more as like a basic guideline for you to get started. The important thing is, is that we need to know the key of the song before we start, so we know which notes to start with. BPM, or beats per minute, is exactly as the definition says. It's how many beats fit into a one minute time span, or 60 seconds. We can determine that in our LCD clock up here in the toolbar. You can see here we have this 120. That's the tempo of our song, or the beats per minute. I can change this by double clicking and typing in different things. So I could do 60 beats per minute, which is half the one we just had. Now 60 beats per minute, there's 60 seconds in a minute. So this is going to be one beat every second. Something else you can do as well is turn on your metronome to know how fast the tempo is. I can do that by pressing K on my keyboard. And because this is 60 beats per minute, and you can see the clock here, the beats fall every single second. 60 beats per minute, 60 seconds in a minute, they're exactly in time. If we wanted to do it every half second, well, we could change it back to the default that we had, 120. And now if we play this, it's twice as fast as the 60 beats per minute. Now this is very important because different genres have different tempos, sometimes radically different tempos. For example, something like lo-fi or hip hop might fall at between like 70 BPM all the way to the quickest, maybe around 95. Whereas house music or dance music sits around 120 to 128. Trap or hip hop these days is kind of falling between 140 and usually even up to 170 sometimes. So the tempo can differentiate based on the genre. And it's super important to know this before you start, especially if you're using loops, because loops are dictated by the tempo and key that they've been made in. So sometimes if you drag a loop in that is at a certain tempo, it'll actually sound kind of off. You need to use it at the specific tempo and key that it's been made to be used at or something very close. Now we can actually get started on making our track and we're going to use a basis for that. 
Chances are why you got into music production is you like listening to music. Now, if you want to start making music like the music that you listen to, this is a great way for you to have a starting point to do that. The tempo and the key to find loops that are similar to the music you like listening to and then use them to actually create the track. We have a great website for this, which is called TuneBat. We're going to use TuneBat to get the BPM and the key of a song that we like, and then we're going to build a track similar to that song using loops with the same parameters. If that doesn't make sense, just follow along and you'll have a better understanding of what I mean in just a second. So the first step is to go to TuneBat.com. This is a very helpful tool when it comes to finding BPMs and keys of songs that you already like. So as you can see right now, these are the top tracks that are actually being searched on TuneBat. We have Harry Styles, Jack Harlow. Obviously, this probably changes time to time with what songs come out. But for us, we're going to actually search a song that we like and we want to emulate or how to sound like. This is the part of the actual course where you can fork off from what I'm doing and start doing your own thing. The artist that I'm going to try emulate is the pretty standard popular artist, Calvin Harris. Now, Calvin Harris has been around for a while, so there's a couple different genres that Calvin Harris has made. I'm going to kind of stick to like the house Calvin Harris, like 18 months album kind of era. So something that's a kind of housey, dancey genre. And we're going to find the key and BPM of some of those songs, and we're going to use that to start using loops to create our song. I'm going to search Calvin Harris, and then I'm going to go search. <clears throat> And now we have all these Calvin Harris songs. We have the key here and the BPM right next to it. So the pieces of information are here. Now we just need to decide which song we kind of want to sound like. So more modern Calvin Harris would be, you know, Potion with Dua Lipa and Young Thug. The kind of 18 months one was uh, like summer, that era. There's Slide, Feel So Close. And you can kind of get an idea of how fast tracks are based on you know, thinking about these songs or listening back to them. So for example, like Summer is kind of older Calvin Harris now, and it sits around 128. Well, that's like a house, kind of a dancey uh, BPM. Whereas now he's kind of laying back into the funk wave volume one, volume two vibe, where he's getting a lot of popular artists to feature rappers and such. Well, rappers don't really jump on house tracks so much. So for example, Potion, it's sitting around 100. Slide, 104. Um, feels 101. So it's kind of sitting around there. I'm going to stick to the house Calvin Harris for this one. And that's because Apple Loops has a ton of house loops and they're really easy to kind of showcase what I'm trying to show you guys. So Summer, let's look at this one. It's in E minor around 128. So let's just remember that for the moment. We'll move down here. Feel So Close is kind of around the same time frame, And that's in G major. And funny enough, G major is actually the same as E minor, it just starts and ends on a different note. We won't get into that too much right now, but that's just interesting to note that they relatively sound the same, and they're also at 128 BPM. This is what you came for with Rihanna, A minor and 124. So we're starting to see a trend here that in that era of Calvin Harris, the 120 BPMs are sort of where we want to sit. Let's go back to our project. We're going to do 125 BPM, something kind of average in the middle there. We'll go back to tune bat and let's see a minor e minor g major for the sake of summer and feel so close being the similar keys like that we're going to use e minor for our track and we know that we're going to be searching for loops that are around g minor and we can also do that in our track by going back to the custom control bar and we can add key signature and save as default and now we can change this to e minor now, what this is going to do is all the Apple loops that we drag into our project now are going to be automatically tuned to E minor. So we don't have to do any of that work. This is super, super helpful for us, especially when we're just testing different sounds, different loops. If I was cha to change this to D minor, it's going to do the same thing with D minor. If I'm going to change this to C major, it's going to do the same thing for that, so on and so forth. But for our sake, we're going to use E minor and 125 BPM. The two crucial points of starting our track are done. The rest here now is trial and error of you exploring different loops, and what sounds good together. So now let's open up Apple Loops and let's start to search for loops based on the parameters that we've just given ourselves. So we can press O on our keyboard and now we can start searching by instrument and genre and adding them into the project 
to make a loop that we're happy with. This is the fun part and where we're actually going to create our track. So for genre, I'm going to go to house because that's kind of the genre that we're looking at. That's the Calvin Harris that we're trying to kind of emulate here. For instrument, I'm going to start with some piano. So I'm going to go to piano. Now we've only been given four samples here out of the whole Apple Loops library. So we might want to not restrict this so much, but let's start with just taking a listen to some of these and see if we want to work with them. It's almost a little too Avicii for me. I don't know if I want that in this case. Cascade Piano Stabs sounds like something we would use in this case. So to bring this into our project, all we need to do is drag that and put it into our arrange window and release it. And now I want you to take note of a couple things that just happened here. Number one, you can see that this loop automatically went to this point right here. And that is at the end of the fourth bar. Now music is typically told especially in modern Western music, in lengths of four bars or a multiple of four, four, eight, 16, 32, et cetera, et cetera. The loop didn't go to six. It didn't go to seven. It didn't go to three. It went to four. This is a very important part of making a loop. The other thing that I want you to notice as well is that we have this up at the top here, which is a little bit lighter gray than this one over here. And this is actually the loop function of Logic Pro. And we can turn that on by pressing C on our keyboard. And it goes yellow like that. This is important because it allows us to play the loop over and over and over and over again without having to drag this back to the beginning, pressing play. It plays to the end. Then we drag it back to the beginning, pressing play. This is going to go to the end here, and it's going to loop, and then it's going to go back to the beginning. So let me show you this really quick. You see how it went to the end of the four and then right back to the one? That's because we have this loop function on. And like I said, you can do that by pressing C on your keyboard. Let's get rid of this software instrument track. And we're going to keep this piano track. I think it's a nice start for a Calvin Harris style song at this BPM in this key. So let's search for something else. The things that I'm looking for here is I want to have a melody. I want to have some drums and I want to have some bass. Those are the three kind of elements that we have. We might have two different melodies, one being the main melody and one being the counter melody, and then one bass and one drum loop. And then we'll kind of mix that together to be our track. So the next thing I'm going to search for is a lead or like a counter melody. I don't want to do piano because we already have that. That's going to sit as the chords in the background. So I can uncheck piano, but I'm going to stay on house. And Calvin Harris sometimes is kind of like an electro house kind of feeling, especially in that era. Now I'm going to go to instrument and maybe do synth. And let's see what we can find in this area. Something that I forgot to mention as well before when you're looking for loops. We have two little sections here and one says tem dot dot dot, which is actually tempo. And that is the BPMs of these loops. Now they will automatically change to our project tempo because these are Apple loops and they've been analyzed by Apple. So when we drag that in, it'll actually sit as this four bar section that we had there before. And the second is the key. And this is going to be the key of the original loop. We can change this parameter down here, play in song key or play in original key. So if I play this airy vox synth here, what I'm just listening back to is the song key. So that's actually being played in E minor because we've set that up here. The original one, if I change it, play in original key, we can hear it's a lot lower and that's because it's being played in C minor. That's also something important is you can play it in the song key when you're searching for different loops to give you a better idea of how it's going to fit in your already made loops. Let's look for a lead. I'm going to search the loops for lead. Let's try this aftershock synth lead. It's at tempo 125, also the same as our project, and it's in C minor, which isn't too far from E minor, so it should sound cohesive. So let's try this. That's very Calvin Harris-like from that era. So let's drag this in. Click and hold that. We're going to drag it just underneath our Cascade Piano Stabs. And now we see we have Aftershock Synth Lead, and we have it just underneath 
It's the same length as Cascade Piano Stabs, and it's been automatically modified to be in the same key E minor that we've set up here. I'm going to zoom in on this one a little bit. And what I'm doing for that is I'm just holding Option, and then I'm pushing with two fingers up on my trackpad. And this is our new four bar loop here. So let's play it together and see if it sounds good. See if it sounds like we want to keep building this. I like it. I definitely know some things that we need to fix with it, but that's going to be later on in the video. But I think that this is going to be just a nice um, combination of something we can use to build this Calvin Harris style track. Now, something to keep in mind as well is we, you don't have to use the same or the first one you find. You can look down this whole list of things that you're looking for. So for the sake of this, I'm going to mute this one. And I just did that by pressing M on my keyboard. You can also use this one here. And let's just find another lead to see if maybe there's a better one. So let's try this memory synth lead one. 128 BPM, close enough, in G minor. It's a little farther away than C minor, but it should be fine. So let's try it. I already know this one's not going to sound as good as the other one, but let's just drag it in so we can test. So make sure you drag to the beginning. We see that it ends at the fourth bar here. So let's play it. A couple things I just want to note. I don't like the way this sounds versus the other one. It's too low. It's clashing with the piano too much. It's too similar of syncopation. And what that is, is the way that it's being played is too similar to this piano. So they're just actually going to clash with each other. It's not going to be complementary. So let's delete this one. Let's try one more. And if we don't find anything, we're going to stick with our Aftershock synth lead. So this one's a little bit different. New Day Synth Lead 03. It's different than the piano in the way that it's syncopated. It's still around 128 and G minor. So it's going to be automatically a bit lower when we drag it in because it's going to be similar to like that memory synth lead. But let's just test it and see how it sounds. That's the beauty of having this software is when you have the tempo and the key set, you can test as many loops as you want and see where they fit together. So bring it back to the beginning. What I'm doing to do that is I'm pressing return on my keyboard, and that'll automatically bring the playhead back to the beginning. And then I press space bar to play the track through. So that one actually sounds a lot better than the previous one. Let's test it against the Aftershock synth lead. So we'll unmute the Aftershock, and we'll now mute the New Day synth. So let's play this. I think I still like the Aftershock synth lead, just the way it sounds. But this is my point, is that it's a lot of trial and error, especially if you're working with loops, to finding something that you like sits together. But it's also the beauty of the software of Logic Pro, is if you have the BPM and the key, you can drag in whatever you like, and it's going to automatically analyze it and make it the same. All you need to do is drag loops that sound good together. So we can delete New Day Synth 03. I just highlighted that and I pressed delete on my keyboard. And these are going to be our main kind of melody, the Cascade Piano Stabs. And the Aftershock Synth Lead is going to be like our counter melody on top of that. We still need two more things. Let's make it three. We need a bass, so something to sit as the lower frequency melody underneath these two. We need a drum loop, something that's a, just kind of like a kick and a clap. And then we're going to add a percussion loop as well. And the reason we're going to do them separately is because we want to affect them separately. You can drag in a full drum loop without question but you don't have the same freedom that you have if it's separate tracks. And the reason for that is because sometimes we want higher frequency things to sit down a little bit. If we want maybe our, uh, our chords and leads to really stand out, we want the low end to be up a little bit. So this is again, the freedom of loops. Sometimes you can use just a regular drum loop, the whole thing on top. And sometimes you need to actually break down the loop into each individual part. And then you can mix it differently depending how you want to do that. Let's look for a bass. Let's stay in house. We don't need to be electro house, but let's go to instrument and we can take out lead here in the search, which will give us more options. And now we're going to search for bass. Let's try this 80s forever bass um, underneath these house dance leads and chords. It still has the tempo of 125, 
the key is F sharp minor. So it's a bit different, but like I said, the software is going to analyze it and change it for us. So let's take a listen to this loop. Not bad. Let's drag it in and see how it sounds. Let's play it with just the Cascade Piano stabs and without the Aftershock synth lead. So we can go about this two ways as well. We could mute the Aftershock synth lead, but another thing you can do is if you're testing different tracks without certain ones, is you can press this S here on the ones that you want. And that's what's known as soloing. So you can solo the Cascade Piano stabs and it automatically mutes the other two because the only one soloed is the piano stabs. You can also do that with the bass. So now we've just added the bass to the piano stabs. This becomes very useful when you have large projects because you're going to want to be testing multiple different tracks at one time. In this case, we'll just solo the piano stabs and the forever bass. I don't mind it. It actually sounds kind of cohesive. Um, it definitely is playing at like a similar syncopation, not quite the same. The differences sound not too bad together. So let's try maybe one more bass loop. And if we don't like it, we'll stick with this one. I can already tell that's going to be too busy. Let's try this analog wonder bass. So I'm going to drag that one in. Now what I can do here is I can solo that one and I can unsolo the 80s forever bass. Now let's take a listen to the piano and the analog wonder bass. So let's take a listen to the 80s forever one more time. I think in this case, I'm going to go with the 80s forever. So we can solo that, we can delete the analog wonder bass, and we can actually take the solo off of the whole thing as well. And they can do that by pressing this one here, which is clear recall solo, which will automatically unsolo anything that is soloed. All right, two last pieces for our track here, and they both fall under drums. So we can unselect bass, we can go all drums, and now we can search by beats and we'll stick to house as well. Now, these tempos are all sitting around the 120 range, which is what we wanted. The keys don't really apply to drums. This is a bit subjective. Some people say that there actually are pitches with certain drum hits, and with something like an 808, there definitely is. But typically, drums don't have a pitch. They're a transient that has too many pitches going on. You can't definitively say what one is. A lot of people will argue with me on that in the comments. That's okay, but I'm sticking with that for the basic purpose of it. You can tune a kick drum, you can tune a snare, but there's so many different frequencies going on. It's hard to say that snare is A sharp or that snare is D flat. Let's find a drum loop. I'm going to use this complete package beat here. We're going to drag that into our project. And now you can see this one's only half the length of our other loops here. This is an easy problem to fix. All you need to do is highlight this region here by clicking it, and then you can press Command R, which will duplicate it. And that way you can have another exact duplicate over next to it. If I drag the playhead out here, you see there's this little gap, and that just signifies that there's two different audio regions. We can also change that by highlighting the track and pressing J on our keyboard. Non-contiguous audio regions require the creation of a new audio file. Create, and it creates a brand new loop for us. I like to have all my loops the same length with no breaks in between because this comes into play later when we're arranging, and I'll explain that later on. But for now, I'm just going to show you how to do that. Now let's take a listen to our whole loop here with the drums. without the drums that we just added. Now this isn't mixed properly, so 
You can't hear them exactly the way you want to. We'll do that later. But I can already tell that drums add so much to a track, especially in the house genre, where drums is kind of like the focal point. Everything else kind of fits around the drums because house is meant to be for dancing. It's meant to have tempo. It's meant to have beat. The last thing that we're going to add to our track here is what's known as a topper or percussion. And usually what kind of loops these are is there things like hi-hats, maybe some offbeat cowbells, claps, snares, things like that. And what they do is when you play them with something with a kick drum and a clap, so just a simple boom, tsh, boom, tsh, like a four on the floor, it really adds movement and feeling to it. So that's what we're going to look for next. So what I'm going to do, unmute the drums, and I'm going to solo the drums. And when we add in the topper there, we're going to test it against the drums first. Because if the topper doesn't work with the basic drum beat, it's not going to work with the rest of the track anyways. The rhythm needs to be different and accentuate different things, but they still need to be cohesive and work together. So let's take a look in our Apple loops for a topper. Let's try this Daybreak Beach Topper. As you can see, there's no kick drum in that when we listen to it. That's perfect because we already have our kick drum in the other drum loop. This is going to accentuate the kick and clap in our other loop by having all these different hats and other things in it. So we can drag that into our project and we can solo it and we'll test it against the drum loop. sounds pretty good to me. If this is your first time producing music and you're listening to this, you might not even be able to tell the difference. But if I actually unsolo this, you'll notice that the drum loop now sounds very hollow. It's missing something. And then if I add the topper in, there's so much more movement and just it just it literally makes you want to dance more by having that in there. So it's important to have those two different elements together, especially when you're getting started because it's so easy to drag a topper on top of just a basic kick drum. And it's gonna be very important later when we're gonna be mixing this track. So now we actually have all the elements of our track and what we want to use. So let's play all these loops together and kind of take a listen to what we've just created using different loops to make a new creation. I don't mind it. I know exactly what we're going to do going forward after this to make it all sound better together, but this already I'm really happy with. And if you're not happy with yours, pick it apart and find out what you don't like about it and get rid of that loop and get a new loop in and test different things. Never settle necessarily. Like don't put something there just for the sake of it. It doesn't necessarily have to make you wow, but everything together should at least sound cohesive and sound good and not clash too much with each other. Now, one more thing I want to mention before we move on to the next section. This is likely going to be our chorus. Why? Because it actually has all of our loops that we've created in this particular track. Obviously, if you have a project with 100 tracks, you're not going to have all 100 playing at the chorus. That doesn't make any sense. But for the sake of this basic music production chorus, I'm showing you that these are the basic elements of what goes into a track, melody, bass, drums. When they all work together, that's what creates the biggest section of the song or most full section, which is typically the chorus. So going forward after this, what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to mix these tracks together so they sound a little better. Some of these already sound a bit overwhelming at certain parts, and we're not able to hear other parts of the song that we really want to hear. And we're going to arrange this loop. So like I said, we've kind of dictated that this is going to be our chorus. Well, we need to work backwards from this full loop into actually telling a story with the song. The verse might be a little more quiet. It might have just the piano or it might have just the drums and bass. We don't know yet. We're going to get there when we start arranging. But what I want you to think about is that we're going to work backwards from this particular loop into making a full song starting at the chorus. So I'll see you in the next section. In our last video, we learned how to go from having a blank, empty project with no ideas to having the starting point for a song 
and starting to add loops to fit together to emulate the song that we're trying to make. We chose a key and BPM of the song that we really like or the genre we really like and want to sound like. And we built a four bar loop using the parameters that we set for ourselves, the key and BPM, to make ourselves kind of a chorus or something that we're going to use to build the rest of our song. Now what we're going to do is cover very basic mixing and arrangement in order to turn it into a full track. Let's start with mixing. At this point, guys, we've chosen all the loops that we want for our track. So we actually don't need Apple loops anymore. So I can press O on my keyboard and get rid of that. What we can do here is we can see our track. We've made this four bar loop. We have the Cascade piano stabs, the Aftershock synth lead, the 80s forever bass, the complete package beat, which is our, our kick and clap or snare, and the Daybreak Beach Topper, which fits on top of the kick and clap. Let's start mixing these together so they sound a little better. If I play this back right now, it sounds good. Everything works, it's in key, it's in the same tempo, but some frequencies or some tracks are actually battling for room against other tracks. So if I was to what's called bounce this right now, which is kind of make it into an MP3 or WAV file, if we listen back to it, it would be really taxing in our ears. There'd be a lot of information, a lot of musical and audio information going in at one time. We don't want that. We want it to be nice and cohesive together. This is where mixing comes into play. What I'm about to show you is simply a drop of water in comparison to a large iceberg. It's not even the tip of the iceberg as to what proper mixing engineers and mastering engineers do with music. What I'm showing you is very, very basic steps to get a track that you've started using loops to sound a little bit more cohesive together. What I'm about to show you is not mixing in comparison to what a mixing engineer can do. This is simply some basic volume leveling, some basic EQ, compression, and later on, I don't even want to call it mastering, but we're going to say it's finishing the track. So I just want you to understand that before we go into this. Mixing isn't simply leveling volumes and calling it a day, but that is what I'm going to show you in this particular video. One of the most powerful things you can do when mixing a track or mixing tracks together is simply level the volumes. You'll find that by taking volumes down, you actually create more space than if you just keep pushing volumes up. We don't want to have a loudness war here with our tracks. We want to simply allow them to fit together better. So let's get started doing that. Now, the first thing that I notice already is that the drums need to be louder. House music, hip hop music, and pop music these days is very, very focused on the beat, the tempo, and how it makes you feel and dance. So immediately I'm going to turn down all of the instruments and bass here to zero. And now we just have the basic complete package beat and the daybreak beach topper. From this one, I'd probably take down the topper a little bit. It has lots going on, and we kind of just want that to fit nicely amongst the kick and clap. We don't want it to overpower it or make it really present. We want our body to kind of feel that with dance music anyways. So let's turn this one down a little bit. Another really good technique for mixing is rather than bringing it down from zero and finding where it fits, start it at no volume at all and bring it up until you feel like it fits in the track. I like it sitting right there. This is around negative 5.5 dB and we're sitting our complete package beat at zero here, or plus one. Let's make it zero. Now, a couple more windows that I want to bring up here to help guide you along the mixing process. Number one, I'm mixing the volumes by just dragging these simple volume faders down and up here. You can actually do this with a more visual look by pressing X on your keyboard to bring up your mixing window. And we now see here, we have all our different tracks and we can see how loud they are in relativity to each other as well as the stereo out, which is what we're going to use to bounce this track afterwards. If you like the visual of having the mixer and all the different knobs this way, this is what 
a actual like mixing studio looks like with the hardware, you're going to have it laid out in front of you like that. Please use that. Please use whatever works best for you. For me personally, I like to have them like this if we only have a certain amount of tracks. It's just easier for me. The second one I want to bring up, which if you don't want to use the mixing window here, is pressing I on your keyboard to bring up the inspector. And that's going to give you the level of volume here or the gain level on the left side here. So if I play this, I'm on the complete package beat here. You can see that we're peaking at around negative 9.2 on that track. And the stereo out is negative 7.4. You don't need to worry too much about the numbers. The only thing that you need to do is make sure that you're not going over zero because that's going to introduce something called clipping. The point is if it sounds good and you can keep it sounding good when you've bounced it out to a finished MP3 or WAV file, then it is good. If you're happy with the way it sounds and other people are too, who cares? But the point is that this is a tool for you to understand when your volumes are too loud. If they go over the clipping threshold, there's going to be certain distortions introduced to your track that you might not want. So to avoid this, simply make sure it doesn't go over zero. Let's just level the volume so they all fit together nicely. So I've done the two drums. Now let's add in the bass. So I'm actually going to solo these three here just so it gives you a better visual of what we're actually working with. The bass is currently at negative infinity, so you can't hear it. We're going to add it in nicely with the actual kick and the daybreak topper so that it fits in nicely. So I'm going to have it sit around there. It's sitting at negative 0.5. This bass isn't really that present. I can show you how to make that better later, but for now, it's kind of just sitting nicely with the complete package beat. Now let's add in the piano stabs, and then last but not least, we'll do the Aftershock synth lead. So Cascade piano stabs, we'll solo it to bring it into the track, and now let's actually make the volume fade so we can hear the piano stabs nicely without taking up too much of the other space. So I like that one around there, negative 4.5. Last but not least, let's add the Aftershock synth lead. Let's solo it, or in this case, because it's the last thing we need to solo, we can simply clear the solo so that all the tracks are playing, and we'll just move the volume fader up so it fits nicely. So I like it to sit around there. It's coming in louder than the piano stabs, and I kind of want that. It's like a very focal point of the mix. We want to know that it's the chorus when this comes in. So now we've leveled out our different levels of the tracks here by moving the volume fader up and down. What I want us to do now is play the whole loop together with our newly leveled volumes, and I want you to take a look at this stereo out here and see where the actual gain gets to. So let's do one loop of this. The peak of this is at negative three, which is great. We're not clipping. We're not introducing any new distortion or sound into this that we don't want. A lot of people will tell you, oh, go to negative 0.1 or go to negative six or negative three. Please don't worry about that for the moment. For now, let's just not go over zero. You might be asking yourself, well, Tony, in this case, shouldn't I just bring everything up to uh, 2.9 dB? So we're at negative 0.1. No, let's not do that because we're going to be adding in some effects and other things that can alter this stereo out gain output as well. The only thing I want you to do, level out your tracks and keep the stereo out below zero. Now the next part of mixing this. We are going to add in some basic EQ or it's short form for equalization. What equalization is, is you're actually taking a specific plugin that can do more than just the volume, but it can boost certain frequencies in the track. These loops are made for the full frequency spectrum. So that means that in this piano here, there's actually going to be low frequency information that we maybe don't want because it's interfering with the bass or the kick drum. The same goes with parts of the drum loop. 
maybe this daybreak beach topper has certain frequencies in the high end that we really want, but the mid ones we don't want as much because that's where the piano is sitting. EQ is kind of like a box that you have a finite amount that you can fit in and you want everything to fit in perfectly, like a Tetris game almost, so that when your listener is listening to your track, everything fits in nicely. The bass isn't too loud. It's not overpowering. The kick drum is present. It makes you feel the beat, but it's not overpowering the melody. The whole thing needs to work together and fit together. And that's what EQ really, really helps with here. So let's do some basic EQ on some of these tracks, and I'll show you how it's going to help you fit them together better. The first one that we're going to do is we're going to take this Aftershock synth lead and this Cascade piano stabs, and we're going to take away the low end frequencies because those aren't what we want to hear from these particular tracks. To add an EQ, you can do this two ways. What I always do is I just click this box that says EQ and it adds it there. And this is the basic channel EQ that comes with Logic Pro. I'm going to close that for a second because we're going to add another one on Aftershock Synth Lead. And the other way to do this is go into the inspector here under audio effects. Now it's in my recent because I just added it, but I can go to EQ, channel EQ, stereo, and it adds one there as well. You can do whatever works for you. I suggest clicking the box because it's quicker. This is where it gets a little bit more tricky. And you might be asking yourself, well, Tony, with EQ, why don't I just turn the volume down of this track to fit the other one? Well, this is a good example. In the Aftershock synth lead, this will give you a visual. This gain knob here is kind of like a volume knob. So if I push this up, you see that we've just added all this frequency information here across the whole spectrum. If I bring this back down to zero, which you can do by holding option and clicking. You can see these little colors here with the little dots, and these are known as bands. You can move up certain frequencies or down certain frequencies, and you can decide how you know, thin or fat you want that band to be to take out or boost certain frequencies. And now if we bring up the whole volume of the track, you can see that there's this little notch missing here. This is super important because what it's doing is it's leaving that space. It's boosting the rest of the track, but it's not boosting that space. Or it might be, but you've actually taken away most of it to begin with. So it's not going to clash with other instruments trying to fit in that space. Let's go back to zero. Same with this band. We'll bring it to zero to make it nice, even looking channel EQ curve. With the piano stabs, let's go to our EQ here, let's solo it, let's play it, and let's look at the frequency spectrum and see the low end information. To do this, we can actually click on the analyzer and click pre, or pardon me, click post and turn it to pre. So let's listen to this. You probably didn't think beforehand that all this information down here existed. The piano is a high frequency instrument. It's being played up here. You assume it's a melody, a melodic instrument. So we can actually add this one down here, which looks like a little hockey stick. So click that. And this little red portion comes up. We can click and drag this all the way up to let's do right here at around 200 Hertz, wherever this red area is, it's taking out the frequencies that we've told it to by dragging over top of them. And we set this to pre beforehand. So we, we can see this here, this EQ. If I click this now and I do post, when I play this next, you'll see nothing will appear in this red area. So let's play this again. If I do pre, you see that there is all this information here. So those frequencies have been eliminated now. We don't need to hear them anymore, and we've just created space for our bass and for our kick drum, because they also reside in those low frequencies, simply by just taking out the frequencies of the other one, and we couldn't even really hear them anyways. Another example that'll be very common is your bass and your kick drum will compete for frequencies, and that's because they're both sitting in a low frequency range. So here's a trick to help you put them together. Let's listen to the complete package beat. We're going to solo that, we're going to add an EQ to it, and we're simply going to look at the spectrum and we're going to listen to the beat. Right away, I can see that this area down here is 
the primary kick drum frequencies. We're simply going to take this orange one, which is what's known as a shelf, and we're going to boost it, let's say 3 dB. And I'm going to sit this around like this area, 90. So now this whole frequency spectrum down here been risen by three decibels. We're also going to take this green band here and we're going to lower it maybe around 200 to 400 in this area here. And I'm making this skinnier by using two fingers on my trackpad and going up, down will make it fatter. We want to make it maybe around here. This is a test. We will likely move this one later. But let's close this and just know that we're ducking it by three decibels, which we can see down here. So we'll close this EQ. And now we're going to go to the 80s forever bass and we're going to add an EQ and we're going to solo it and we're going to listen to this before adding anything. Let's test this out by taking out all of this low frequency information where the kick drum has a lot of frequency information and just see if we can actually tell a difference with this. So there definitely is some sub bass in there that could really fit nicely in the track, but we want it to work again with our kick drum. So what we can do is we're going to make this at 100, and we're going to take out all of those frequencies underneath that, and that's going to save room for that little boost that we made with the shelf for the kick drum. If you remember correctly on the kick drum EQ, we also took this green band and we ducked around 300 for three decibels. So let's do the reverse of that with this one. Put this up three decibels. And let's listen to this and see the difference with and without it. So that was with. Let's take it off. It boosts a little bit. Let's just turn it on. Let's use this Hertz parameter here. And we'll drag it up and down and see where the most frequencies sound the best. And we can also boost the gain on this a lot to test and really hear it. After doing that, I actually want it to sit around 300 a little more. So let's do plus three decibels at 300. This is going to accentuate that mid-range, that kind of distortion bite of the bass. And we'll go back to the complete package beats and make sure that we're ducking 300 at three decibels as well. We're making space for that bass to be a little more crunchy because on this complete package beat, this kick drum is a very big focal point and then some of the high end slash mid where the snare and clap is. So now let's listen to them together with the EQs and then I'll take the EQs off and we'll see if there's a difference. We'll solo the 80s forever bass and we'll solo the complete package beat and we're gonna play this. Let's take off the EQs. It's very subtle, the differences, but I can tell from listening to it that they sound so much better together when you help them fit together. By taking out certain frequencies you don't need in certain tracks and adding them, in the other track and vice versa. In this case, we took out the frequencies of the 80s forever bass under 100 hertz. Why? Well, because it didn't accentuate enough of what we wanted in the bass, but in the complete package beat, the kick drum is really what we wanted to hear. So we boosted that frequency under 100. It just makes things fit together better and gives you more optionality and how to actually fit things together instead of just boosting and lowering volumes. This is what EQ is, and it's so, so, so important, especially when it comes to later stages of your music production, when you start to get better and more and more tracks get involved, everything needs a space in the frequency spectrum. Let's do a couple more simple EQ tricks that I'll go over very quickly without explaining the theory of it, but just know that I'm carving frequencies out and adding frequencies where they need to be. The Daybreak Beach Topper, let's solo it. 
there's all this low frequency information and we really just want it to be high frequency. So we can take this and we can cut out everything down there. Again, for people that are mixing engineers or people watching this that do know how to use EQ, what I'm doing is a very simplified version of this. I don't think that you should just automatically add an EQ and take out the low end. For the purposes of this course, I want to show you how things fit together. It sounds the same way that we wanted to. We can add the complete package beat. And after adding that EQ, I think we have a little bit more room for volume with the Daybreak Beach Topper. So I'm going to boost this up maybe another dB. Let's play the whole loop now and make sure that we've set the EQs where we want to make things fit together in the best way possible. I know what we need to do. We need to make the Aftershock synth lead and the Cascade piano stabs fit together better. There's too many clashing frequencies there and we really need to differentiate them. In the Cascade piano stabs, I'm going to cut out frequencies that the Aftershock synth lead really, really needs to accentuate with. I'm gonna click the EQ on this and we're gonna simply watch the EQ of the Aftershock synth lead and boost where we want them. I can see here that around 800 hertz is where the majority of that buzziness is coming from the lead that we really like and want. I'm going to boost it by 3 dB at 800 hertz. Now I immediately am going to go to the piano and I'm going to test to make sure that when I take out 3 uh, dB, it still sounds good. So let's go to 800. Let's take out 3 dB. And let's play it. You can definitely tell a difference because it's a melody and this is starting to get into the mid to the high range of where the melody frequencies kind of lay. But it's not enough to keep in here at the expense of making the Aftershock synth lead not work. Let's leave it in there. Let's add the Aftershock synth lead and let's take a listen. So we did that to make room for the synth lead well, we should actually fill in part of the piano that we don't need in the synth lead. So let's take a listen to the piano. I think what we can do is add this wide shelf towards the end, right around 2000 Hertz, and we'll boost it by three. And we'll do the same thing to the Aftershock synth lead. We will take this to 2000 and we will take it down by three. Now let's listen to this together. And with the whole loop, now what we've done is we've added some basic EQ to the whole loop and different tracks and different frequencies to help it fit together better. The first step is always doing the volumes. Afterwards, EQ out what you don't need and add what you do and make your mixture sound cleaner and more glued together. Something I wanna talk about, which we're not necessarily going to go too in depth on in this particular course, is compression. Compression is also equally as important as EQ. What compression is, is it's taking the quiet parts of a track and making them louder. It's taking the loud parts of a track and making them quieter. I'm not going to use a compressor on any of these particular tracks because compression becomes very useful when you start to have groups of tracks, which we're not going to get into in this course because this is a basic course. But what I just want you to know is that compression is something that you should research and learn at the earliest stage possible of you getting into music production, especially when you start to have projects that are over five tracks because it's so, so helpful. We are going to be using compression at the very end of this course to help glue our final track together. I don't wanna use the term, but mastering uses compression to bring up certain parts of the track and tame other parts to make it fit together better. What we're doing is not mastering, it's finishing the track, which is going to be a very, very, very basic mastering lesson. I just want you to know that compression is very important and you should without question be using it and researching how it works 
in your tracks. Another thing that we won't be necessarily using on these tracks, but something that you would definitely want to explore is using different audio effects on different parts of your track. So luckily these loops that we got from Apple Loops all sound pretty good out of the box. But if you're recording a guitar, just plain basic guitar or piano, or you're using the Yamaha Grand in Logic, they sound very dry. Now what dry is, is there isn't any effects on top to bring it to life. A very popular one is reverb, which basically makes an instrument feel like it's in an actual space. So for example, this Cascade Piano Stabs, if I solo it, there's already reverb on this track from the loop. But what I'll do is I'll add a reverb so you understand what I'm saying in terms of adding more ambiance and space to the track. You can do this with not just reverb, but any audio effect. And we're not going to be adding any onto these tracks, but I will show you how to access them and you can add them onto your tracks if need be. So we have the Cascade Piano Stabs here in the inspector. We can go down to just under the channel EQ and it says click to insert audio effect plugin. So we'll click that. And now we have all of our options for audio effects. This can be a little bit intimidating off the bat, especially if you don't know what certain things do. But the more you spend in here and the more tracks you use, the more understanding you'll have about what audio effects do what. We're going to go to reverb and we're just going to use a space designer, which is a stock reverb that comes with logic and it sounds great. Stereo. And now we have this reverb plugin on top of our Cascade Piano Stabs track. So let's listen to this Cascade Piano Stabs without the reverb to start, and then I'll add it on and you can see what I mean. Now let's turn the Space Designer on. You can see that it's actually bleeding into each other a lot more, and that's the reverb. Like I said, there's already reverb on this actual track that's been printed into this audio file, so we don't need this. You can click there and do no plugin. But if you feel like a track is, is very dry and it actually needs some more feeling to it, reverb is a great option for that. And these audio effects here, there's tons of different ones for you to explore and add to your tracks and see where they fit best. And you'll start to recognize certain effects that you've maybe heard in the past. We're not going to be using any on this project except for the EQ. So I'm going to turn the solo off of that. But I just wanted to show you where you can find audio effects and start exploring with different ones. On different tracks. We've done some basic mixing with our five audio loops here. Now in the next section what we're going to do is we know it fits together all the tracks but we want to start telling a story using the arrangement of moving tracks across the board, taking certain tracks out at certain parts to keep our listener interested and this is basically the beginning of you starting to make a song. The journey of the actual song being played through. I'll see you in the next video in just a second. Now we're going to actually take our loop that we've mixed and make it into a full song. This is called arrangement. And what we're going to be doing is taking our 8-bar loop, duplicating it across our project, and then we're going to take out and add parts of the loop in to tell a story to keep our listener interested for the full length of the track. So we can see our loop here that we had in the last video. We have the piano, the lead, the bass, and the two drum tracks underneath there. So to arrange this loop out to start telling the story, what we can do is we can highlight all of these by either pressing Command A, and you can see all the regions highlighted there, or we can click and drag all of the regions so that they're all highlighted. Now at this point, we're going to press Command R to duplicate across our project, across our arrangement window, so we have multiple of these choruses and we can start to take out and add things that we need. Now, arrangement is a very interesting part of music production because it's very subjective. Some people tend to like different parts of the song more than others, and therefore might really accentuate that part of the track when they're producing it. The most important thing you can do is just try to tell a story with what you have available. So that's exactly what we're going to do with our loop here. We're going to change our cursor to the eraser tool. And we can actually do that by pressing T to bring up this little menu. And you can see all of these little letters on the side here when I go down. Those are the corresponding letters that I can press and it will give me the tool that's listed next to it. So if I press E, we can get our eraser tool. 
And now you can see that we can erase regions throughout our arrangement window there. And this makes it a lot easier for arranging tracks because you have the capability for you to actually visually see what's being played and where you should and shouldn't add things back and forth. So I'm going to add those regions back in because I don't want to take those out there. But a couple things to keep in mind when you are arranging things. If we were to just play the four bar loop across the whole track, our listener would get very bored very quickly. We need to start with something small and then bring it in slowly. And then at the chorus, like we said, that we're working backwards from, that's where we're going to have the maximum tracks playing or the kind of chorus loop we created earlier. What I'm going to do is think for a second what I would like to start with and then start adding elements to this. Something else to keep in mind is that music is typically arranged in bars of four. Four and eight bar loops, depending on the genre and how fast it is, is sort of the section amount that you want to give a track without adding or taking anything away. Now, as things get more complicated, you can definitely have little nuances and things throughout the track. But for the sake of keeping this simple, let's just think in portions of four bar loops because that's exactly what we made for our chorus. I actually really like the Cascade Piano Stabs to start off. I think that it's a nice part of the track to introduce to people at the beginning. So we're going to get rid of everything underneath that and just have the piano stabs to start and introduce something after that. We'll start from the beginning and I'm going to play this through. And this is what it will sound like when the person clicks play on our track for the first time. I'm going to stop it right before it goes into the next loop there because we haven't taken anything out yet and it's going to be just a lot of sound coming at you at one time. Now we have to think to ourselves, what part of the track do we want to add next? If we played the piano stabs over again for one loop, chances are our listener is going to get bored and probably turn our track off. So we need to add at least one more thing. And what I think we should do is add either the bass or we should add this Daybreak Beach Topper. I think it's different enough that the listener will notice something's been added and realize that we're building them up to something, but it's not busy enough like the Aftershock synth lead or the package beat that it immediately feels like we're in the chorus. Let's try the Daybreak Beach Topper and not the bass, and we'll see if that sounds good. If not, we will maybe add the bass. So we'll start from the beginning, press play. After this first eight bars, I think that we should go into the chorus because that really is bringing in what we're trying to give the person. Let's also take the bass out from this nine all the way to 13 here, and we'll use the bass in the second half of the chorus. So this part is going to be the intro. This part is going to be the chorus. And after here at the 17th bar, we're going to start a verse. Like I said, there can be different amounts that people use for the intro or for verses or chorus, but traditionally in a lot of popular music, you'll find an intro being maybe eight bars or 16 bars, then you move into the chorus or the hook, and then you drop into the verse, which is going to be a bit longer, typically twice the length of a chorus. So in this case, we're going to make the verse this long here, which is a total of 16 bars. Four, 8, 12, and 16. After the chorus, we're going to go back into kind of bringing it back down to strip down to nothing. And then the verse, we're going to build it up and drop it again at another chorus. We can start to take things out after the chorus here. Should we do the piano again, or should we actually do something even a little bit more stripped back? Let's try just start with the bass and the topper and see how that sounds after the chorus. So I'll turn the loop function off by pressing C. I'll start on the second half of the chorus here and really take note of what happens after this chorus finishes into this section here at the beginning of the verse where we don't have much going on. See if it sounds pleasing to you and then keep moving forward if it does sound good. If it doesn't, we'll reapproach and we'll have a different track in there to start.
So that sounds more like a breakdown to me. I think that we made a mistake by just having the base in there with the topper. So what we're going to do is we'll get rid of these and we will simply highlight the whole stack again. We will click and hold and then press option so that little plus adds and we'll move it back so that we have the full stack again and we can reapproach this. Let's keep it simple like what we did with the intro and we'll just have the piano. So we can erase everything here except the piano. And now we can start adding little things all the way up to this point here in which we'll make a bit of a breakdown before the chorus. I think we can get rid of the topper, the bass, and the lead so that it's going to go with the piano and the kick drum. Then from this point, we can actually get rid of the synth lead and the topper so it has the bass. And then this breakdown here we'll approach after listening to these first three sections of the verse. So let's take a listen. I actually really like the way that that sounds so far. If this track sounds very bare, it's because it is. And this is actually something where a vocalist really comes into play nicely. A lot of the times instrumentals can be very boring or very basic. And when you add a vocalist on top, that's the right amount of differentiation you need in order for it to really bring the track to life. In this instance, like I said, because this is a hand-holding beginner's course, I just want you to start thinking about the arrangement concept of how tracks are actually arranged to tell the story. For the breakdown, I liked the way that the bass and the topper sounded that we kind of tried for the beginning of the verse at the beginning. So we'll take out the package beat, the synth lead, and the uh, piano. Now the verse is going to lead into this little breakdown, and then we'll go back to the chorus right here. So let's listen from the end of this little verse section through the breakdown, and we'll go into the beginning of the chorus and see how that sounds. Usually when you listen to tracks that are on Spotify or that are really popular amongst people, there's so many more things going on. There's things like audio effects, risers, sweeps, sweep ups, sweep downs, white noise, all to make you really notice that there's changes going on. And this is a very stripped down version. However, I'm going to show you a little trick that is very commonly used and is actually a great trick to use when you don't have many tools to work with. Right before the chorus, if we zoom in here, this is the last bar in our little breakdown before the chorus. Well, we can take out parts of the drum loop so that it really just accentuates the bass, and that's our last thing. We're taking out as much frequencies and sound as possible so that when the chorus comes in, there is absolutely everything going on from previously having nothing going on. So we can grab the edge of this Daybreak Beach Topper region and go to the bottom right corner so we get that icon there. Now, if you click and you drag, you'll notice that it disappears. And now this track space is vacant. So the Daybreak Beach Topper goes all the way from here to here. So three of the four bars, and then it drops out at the end, leaving just the bass playing on the 32nd bar. And in the 33rd bar, we have the chorus. So let's listen to this breakdown one more time. And it'll kind of give you an idea of how we accentuated the bass to bring everything stripped down to nothing and then drop it into the chorus. The other thing that I want to do is get rid of the synth lead from the first portion of the chorus, and that kind of just gives it another addition when we move to the second part of the chorus here. So it'll drop in like this. We've created an intro, a hook or a chorus. We've moved into a verse, which has a little breakdown at the end, and into the second chorus. 
Now at this point, we're kind of starting to rinse and repeat. We would create a second verse, another chorus, then maybe another bridge or breakdown, and then finally another chorus and an outro. We won't go too much in depth for that right now, but what we're going to do to just get to the end of this song so I can show you how to finish it is we're going to duplicate this across so we have another set, another verse and a chorus. We can erase these two particular blocks. We can grab from here. We know this is the beginning of the verse, so we'll grab all of these and we can do Command R to repeat that. So now we have another duplicate of the verse right after the chorus. So we can kind of reuse certain parts of our arrangement and they're far enough away from each other that the listener still thinks that they're different. To finish off the track, we're going to make kind of another breakdown or bridge and then it's going to go into one last chorus and an outro to finish off the song. So the breakdown, I really liked this bass and topper breakdown that we did before, but maybe we should change it up by using the actual synth lead to make the listener really wonder what's going on. So we're going to duplicate this synth lead across twice. We can hold option and click this and drag that over once and again, or you can also highlight the region and press command R twice. It's up to you. And I think what we should do is have this topper as well. So I've highlighted those regions and pressing Command R to repeat it over. And we know that after this eight bars here, we want to have another chorus. So we can grab these ones and we can click Option and drag it over there. This is where you'd have the vocalist come in and really accentuate an important piece of the music where it's tying it all together before our big chorus at the end. So let's take a listen. Let's do the same thing that we did with the topper here where we take it out and it really accentuates the lead before going back to the big chorus. And we'll actually put the lead in there on the chorus as well, because it's nice to continue that onward. Now we can add an outro. I think I'm just going to use the piano like we started with, which kind of ties the track all together again and then that will be the finish of our track. Now, if we put the playhead right at the end of the last region here, and we look up on the LCD here, we can see that the time of the track is two minutes and 41 seconds. Depends how many verses, how many choruses, how long your sections are, how long your regions will determine the length of the track. In a typical house track, this is pretty short, but again, for the purposes of this course, I just want to show you how to actually arrange tracks and what you can do to make different parts of the track sound different from each other, despite using the same sounds all the way throughout. So we know this is going to be the end of our track. We can zoom out and we can grab this little arrow in the corner and just drag it right to the end of our region so that when we end up bouncing out this track, the length of the MP3 or WAV file will be the length of exactly where we have the end of the track at. This is a very basic overview of arrangement and how you can take things out and add things in to tell a story just by starting with your eight bar loop. I won't play this for you start to finish, but you get an idea of how things work in terms of where the piano is, where you should use certain things, how long certain parts of the song should be. Now, if you want to get better at this, the best way to do that is simply by listening to the songs that you want to emulate. You'll notice some deep house tracks are maybe 10 minutes long and the intro is three minutes. Well, in our case, our intro is only 15 seconds. Everything is different in that sense. But really notice when you're listening to music, what's coming in, what's leaving, and what parts of the song have certain elements in it. That's a really great way to improve your arrangements and also just have a better understanding of where things fit together.
In the next section and the final section of this Logic Pro music production course, I'm going to show you how to finish your tracks. So what we've done is we've made the loop, we've mixed the tracks, we've arranged it into a song. Now what I wanna do is show you how you can get it ready to bounce out to an MP3 or a WAV file, upload to a streaming platform, share it with friends and family, or simply just listen to it yourself and move on with your music production career. So let's get into that section now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are finally on the last section of this Logic Pro crash course for how to get started using Logic Pro. From an absolute beginner, we're going to finish off our track here and prepare it to be bounced out to an MP3 or a WAV file so that we can share with friends and family or listen to ourselves and try and improve. Now, what I really want to reiterate to you is that what I'm about to show you is by no means mastering. What I'm about to show you is simply finishing this track so that when you bounce it out, it's not really, really quiet and you can't hear it. We're going to be taking the track that we've made and we're going to put on some simple Logic stock plugins that are known as mastering plugins and we're going to finish it off and bring the volume up so it sounds full. But I suggest that you just follow along here with what I'm saying, knowing that it's not professional mastering. Now, because this is a basic Logic Pro course, I'm gonna use stock Logic Pro plugins to show you of how to finish your tracks. We have our final track here that we arranged in the last section of the video. What I wanna do is I'm gonna loop the loudest part of our track here, which is going to be the second half of our choruses. And you can see that here, it's because we have all of these tracks playing at one time. The next thing that we want to do is start adding mastering plugins to the stereo out. The stereo out is the second one in the inspector here. We can also pull up our mixer by pressing X and we can see the stereo out here. And this is the area where we're going to add our mastering plugins. Number one we're going to do is add what's called a linear phase EQ. This differentiates from a channel EQ. I can't tell you exactly the differences for it, but what it is, it's a more heavy duty EQ. I don't think that I have enough mastering skill to really show you how to use this properly. But one thing that I want to show you is in this drop down, you can go to mastering. And this is a preset that's included when you download all of the additional content for Logic Pro. So you see there's dance music type EQ, there's final mix ballad, final mix dance, hip hop, pop, rock, etc. Let's do a dance music type EQ because we were trying to kind of emulate Calvin Harris in this sense. So it's like a pop dancey track. The loops we've used are house dance loops. So let's start with this particular preset and see what they're doing with the EQ and if we actually need this or if this isn't what we're shooting for. So we'll click that preset. Basically what we can see is they've increased the gain across the board here and they've ducked out about two decibels around 3,500 Hertz. Now, I can't tell you again the specifics of why they've done this, but let's just play it with this preset on it, and then we'll take the preset off and we'll compare. If it sounds better, we'll keep it. If it doesn't, we'll get rid of it. And now let's play without. I actually like the way that it sounds better with that particular preset. Mastering isn't about using presets and templates. It's definitely a process that involves you diving in and learning about why you're boosting certain things or taking certain things away. In this particular instance, I'm gonna say, let's use the linear phase EQ with this preset and we'll move on to the next plugin. Below this one, the next one that we wanna do is a compressor. Now I know I mentioned compression beforehand in the mixing part of this course, and I'm going to explain some basic parameters of compression now, but compression is something that you should really research and look up at yourself. And the best thing that you can do is just test. Use it on your projects where it's necessary and know when to use it. But let's go over some basic parameters and I'm gonna add the compressor to squish this track so that it sounds like a nice cohesive wall of sound that we can bounce out to an MP3 or WAV file. Underneath the linear EQ, we can click this open spot and we can go to Compressor, which is under Dynamics, Compressor, Stereo. Now this is what the stock Logic Pro compressor looks like. And you'll notice here under the factory default, under the dropdown, there is all these other presets as well. And I believe there is a set of mastering presets. 
Now, I would like to use just the compressor tools, and these are just some options that we can use as a baseline, again, for compression on our stereo out for the final track. I think what I want to do is something like platinum analog tape. So we'll click that one, and now it's set these different parameters for us based on that template. I'm going to go over these parameters really briefly for you and just give you an understanding of how they work. But again, this is a plugin that you should really dive into separately, watch compressor videos and how a compressor works. As I explained briefly before, what a compressor does is it takes the quiet parts of a track and makes them loud, it takes the loud parts of a track and makes them quiet. This is especially useful in mastering because we've already done all our mixing, we know where things want to sit in the track, but there are probably little pockets that we need to fill in with sound. This helps bring those pockets up or tame certain frequencies so that they're not the focal point of the track and really clipping our track in certain ways. So let's listen to this with the preset that we've set here, and then we'll make changes as we go about it. The first thing that I noticed right off the bat is we actually just clipped with this being put on top. Now that's going to be based on certain parameters here, most likely the auto gain being at zero. What we can do is we can turn all of our tracks down by selecting one, holding shift and selecting the top one, and then we can bring all of our tracks down so that we no longer clip. So let's play this again. We're still clipping by 0.6. Let's bring it down a little more. So now we're at negative 0.9. Now let's go back to the compressor and let's take a look at the meter and the graph and see what it's doing. So right away we notice the needle is kind of hanging out around negative four, negative three. That's not a lot of compression and that's actually pretty much what we want in this particular case. If you absolutely squash your track, you're going to be bringing up parts that are quiet, way too loud, and it's just not what we want in a mastering process. Mastering is about using subtle compression and subtle EQ to really bring out or take away parts of the track that you don't want. In this case, let's listen to it without and with, and we'll see how it sounds. The first thing that I notice is it really brings up that aftershock synth lead to really sit as a focal point. It also really brings up the bass. Now, these are two things that I think maybe needed a little more life in them in comparison with the drums and the other piano. I think that sounds pretty good for the chorus. Let's take a listen though, as soon as we leave the chorus, because at that point, we just have this piano. sounds better than I expected. However, I will go over some of the parameters and we can make some subtle changes just so you understand what they actually do. Threshold. This is the point in which the signal is going to start making the compressor work. So as soon as our song goes over negative 12 dB, that's when the compressor is going to come in. If it goes below that, it's not going to be affected by the compressor. The ratio is how much the compressor is going to take the track down. So as soon as our audio signal goes over negative 12.5 dB, it's going to be reduced by a ratio of 1.6 to 1. Therefore, taming the transients that are going over that particular threshold. These are the two main components of a compressor. Makeup gain is the amount of gain that you're going to add that is lost by compression. So if we're going to be taming certain parts of the actual signal, there's going to be certain parts that need to be brought up in order for it to kind of be equal at that point. Now, knee is going to be how sharp you want the compressor to actually act when it breaks the threshold. So when it's at one here, we'll take a look at the graph for this example, and we turn it down to zero, you can see that the knee changes. It's a lot sharper when it goes over this negative 12.5 versus if we bring it to one, it's actually a more gradual curve before getting there. What this means is that if it goes over the threshold and it's at zero, 
it's going to immediately be compressed by 1.6 to 1. Whereas the other way is maybe a bit before negative 12.5, it might start to compress it a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more. So it's a little bit smoother of a compression as we approach the threshold that we've set. Attack and release are two different parameters to tell the compressor when we want it to act and when we want it to release. Attack, this is in milliseconds here, is going to be how long after the threshold do we want it to start acting? Now, you might ask yourself, why would you want to delay on that? A certain example is if you really want a kick drum transient to really be present in a track and you want it to thump like that, even just delaying it by 47 or 50 milliseconds, it will allow that initial transient through and then compress the rest of the kick drum. Now, release is the opposite of attack. How long do you want the compressor to hold on for? versus when do you want it to start attacking. All of these other parameters are also very useful, but these six are kind of the main that you need to worry about and really train your ears to understand what they do. Now, a limiter is what we're going to be using next on our finishing track chain or mastering chain, if you will, but we're not going to be using it inside this particular compressor. I like the way that this preset and template came out because it gives us some subtle compression and it brings up the part of the tracks that needed to be presented more, but it doesn't compress too much in the sense that we're now presenting just a wall of sound and it's uncomfortable to listen to. We can close up the compressor and we can add our last particular part of this mastering chain, which is going to be a limiter. We'll click this one here. We'll go down to dynamics. We'll go down to limiter and we'll do stereo. Now this is a basic limiter that comes with Logic Pro. So the purpose of the limiter is to make sure that the audio signal does not go over zero dB. It's going to limit our audio signal so that we're not going to have any of that clipping or distortion. And we can do that by pushing the audio signal with this gain knob here. Let's turn our loop function back on by pressing C. You can see that that yellow section is highlighted again. And it's at zero gain right now, so we're not adding any additional gain. Let's play this and let's push the gain until we hear distortion. And then we'll start to back off. So you could see when I pushed the gain around plus four and, and beyond, we actually started to go over zero and then it gave us this red output and the yellow warnings here. And you could start to hear some distortion being introduced. So that's what we don't want. The reason we want the limiter is to limit the signal and keep it clean while bringing loudness and fullness to the track. I think that we should sit here at plus 3.2 so we can close this up. And now we have this basic chain here that we've made to help finish off our track and really bring it to life. So let's take a listen to the track without these, and then I'll add them afterwards and we can do a bit of a comparison. Another way to remove plugins very quickly, if you have them in sequence like this, is you can click the top one and then drag down and it will actually turn off the other ones. So watch this. Now we have nothing on the stereo out. Let's take a listen to this without everything. And now we'll add everything on top. It sounds much fuller. It sounds better. It sounds more like we could listen to that in our headphones. It's not going to be super quiet. Now we're approaching the end of this Logic Pro music production crash course, and I hope that you've learned what goes into music production and the different stages in which you really need to improve at in order to become a really good music producer. Again, I really want to hit home that a lot of the topics that I touched on were just a raindrop in terms of the tip of an iceberg for how you really can dive in and learn and get better at and become more skilled at. Music is a process that I don't think you ever truly conquer. It's just something that you could always be adding to your tool belt and getting better at. But this is an absolute bare bones, cliff notes version of how to take a song from absolutely nothing, just an idea in your head or someone that you admire listening to, and at least turn it into a finished track that you can share with your friends or listen to or share with your family. The absolute last step of this is we're going to do what's called bouncing our track. Now I did some prep work for this and I did tell you about it, but what we've done is we moved the end of the track to right here, which is the end of the last region. So that means when we bounce this track, 
it's going to be finished right at the region here at 241. We did some mastering or finishing of the track using the linear phase EQ, the compressor, and finally the limiter to bring up the signal to make sure it's at a level we want to hear. Now what we can do is take our track and bounce it to a wave or MP3 file. To do that, we're going to select one of the tracks here and then we're going to click off of it to an open area on the arrange window so nothing is highlighted. So you don't want that, you don't want that, you don't want any of this. You just want to make sure nothing is highlighted. Then we're going to go to the beginning of the track, press return. And now we're going to bounce the track by going up to file, bounce, project or section. And you notice here on the side, you can also do command B. That's typically what I do because I like hotkeys. So command B. And this is the section you can use to actually bounce your song. I don't really know much about these different parameters. PCM here is the destination. This is a wave file. And you also have MP3 here as well. I usually bounce to wave because it's a lossless audio quality. It's always good to double check the start. So this is 1111. That just means that we're at the very beginning of our track. And the end is in the 85th bar. So if I cancel this and go out, we see that the end is at, in fact, 85. Go back to the beginning, command E for bounce. And then what we can do is hit OK. And that's going to give us our finished wave file. We can name this Logic Pro Free Course Track. I'll save it to my desktop. And then we can just click bounce. And that will only take a second. And what it's doing is it's compressing and it's writing it to the WAV file or MP3 file format. And that's pretty much it, guys. Thank you so much for sticking with me throughout the whole process of this Logic Pro course. I really hope that if you were approaching music production and you had no prior knowledge that you learned something and you can at least piece together yourself a little bit of a map so that you can start a track and finish a track. I think that one of the hardest things to do as a producer is finish tracks. It's so easy to make eight bar loop after eight bar loop after eight bar loop and never take it farther than that. However, it's very, very necessary if you do want to progress as a producer. With that being said, this is the last lesson of the course, but I am going to do one little bonus section of this course just after this. So I suggest you stick around. And what that's going to be is my suggestions and directional advice for how I think you can get better as a music producer. This is the absolutely basic bare bones, but what I want to do is point you in the right direction to getting better. So stick around and check out that last video, but thank you so much for following along in terms of the course content, and I hope that you learned something and progressed as a music producer today. All right, you guys, so this is the last section of my Logic Pro crash course for you guys. Again, I want to reiterate how much I appreciate you sticking around, and I hope that you learned something to help with your foundational music production skills. Now, before I leave you, I just want to leave you with a few more things in terms of how to get better. Like I said, today I showed you the absolute basic bare bones of what it takes to make a track and what it takes to go into a track. But I think it's super important to push yourself and really see results from day one. And we've just made a track from scratch today and I've given you the steps to do so. Keep making tracks, keep finishing tracks, Keep pushing through when you're not into making tracks, and I promise you, you'll get better as a producer. Here are some other resources that I want to share with you that really helped me progress as a producer, and I think that they're there for a reason and will really help you as well. So let me show you these. The first thing that I want to tell you about that Logic also has built into it with all the additional content is demo projects. Now, this happens when you first open up Logic, you'll get this prompt here so you can do the new project your recent projects, starter grids for live loops. There's different tutorials to actually walk you through Logic and they're done by Logic Pro as well. But this one here, demo projects. Now these are actual projects that are professional songs. As you can see, there's Billie Eilish, there's Lil Nas X. What they are is a great way for you to explore how a professional producer approaches a track. So quite literally, if you highlight on Billie Eilish Ocean Eyes, you can see composed and produced by Phineas O'Connell. So that's Billie Eilish's brother, who's her producer. If you click into this, which I will, so I just go Billie Eilish Ocean Eyes, choose. So this is the actual project file that Phineas used for Billie Eilish Ocean Eyes. He uses Logic Pro. He's quite an avid supporter of Logic Pro. And you can see how he puts things together to make this song. 
So it's very cool because you can see Billy's vocals here. So there's the verse vocals, the harmony, the vocal stack, which you see if you hit this little arrow here. There's the lead vocal, the layers. You can go down and see the vocal textures, the dark pad, everything that went into this track. This is the broken down version. And you can see how different elements are used in a professionally produced and popular track. One of my favorite things to do is open up these demo projects and look at parts of the song that I'm struggling with and seeing what they've done to really produce a full track. So for example, on this dark pad here, looks like he's done some basic EQing. He's brought up certain frequencies, ducked a few, and then, you know, the custom piano, he's again EQed some things out. He's added a compressor, a bit crusher. It's really cool to turn on and off plugins and see what they do with real professional produced tracks. I strongly encourage you to open up these demo projects and explore them, solo different tracks and play them so you can get an idea of what different sounds sound like. A couple other things that I want to tell you as well. We used Apple Loops to make our track, those loops that were given to us by Apple included in Logic Pro. There's also a great website called splice.com. Now Splice has become a forefront in the music industry in terms of providing one shots and loops. And I really like the way that they've presented loops to you. And you also get a monthly credit system. So I believe at this time it's $9.99 a month and you get 100 credits, which equals 100 samples or 100 downloads per month. There's a lot of great producers that release packs on Splice. Some of my favorite packs are also coming from there and they're at a pretty affordable price too. The thing that I love about Splice is you can actually search by genre, BPM and key, just like in Logic. And it's a good way to just explore some loops outside of Logic as well. Like I said, there's 30,000 loops in Apple Loops. So it would be pretty hard to go through all of them and know everything. But you will find if you go down rabbit holes of certain genres, you eventually will get to a point where you're not finding anything new. This is where Splice is great because they always have updating loops coming in from lots of different sample labels. And some of those sample labels are being used in professional tracks all across the world. Highly recommend checking out splice.com. They're great for finding loops. The last things I wanna say is just a few words from me, and this is just more words of encouragement and some directional advice. Things are explore your curiosity. If you find a genre or a song that you like, take note of how fast it is. Notice the tempo. Try and download it from the internet, put it into your project and try and find out the key or add things on top of it or take things away. Put it in your project and see how the arrangement is. See where the verse is, see where the chorus is, see what they take out and what they bring in. Just listen and always be studying when you're listening to music. Music is without question for enjoyment and I think it's important to set aside time to listen to music strictly for that. However, if you're sitting on the bus or in transit or you're going to work and you want to improve yourself as a producer, Really listen to the track that you're listening to and how it's put together. I guarantee you'll pick up little things that you want to add into your track later or different arrangement tips and tricks and techniques. Trying to copy and emulate people is great. And in my opinion, it's the best way to get better. However, just because someone tells you not to do something in music production doesn't necessarily mean don't do it. Try new things. Don't be afraid to push the boundary because that's truly where innovation comes from. Just because I told you something in this course that you should do and that's the way it is, does not mean that you should listen to me. What happens if you push the limiter past the gain and it introduces distortion? Well, this is actually how the birth of like a lot of the South Florida rap scene happened. They were just using limiters and pushing them and putting lots of distortion and that actually created a whole scene. Listen to tracks, emulate them, but also don't be afraid to try new things and push the boundary. And last, but without question not least, practice. You always need to put the time in. You need to train your ears to learn what you like, what you don't like, what works in certain situations and what doesn't. You're never going to get better just by taking a course or just by downloading another sample pack or getting a new plugin. You absolutely need to put the time in that goes with it. Practice is going to be your best friend and at times you're going to be very frustrated and maybe not want to produce music for a little while and that's totally okay because we've all been there. The most important thing you can do is just open up your DAW when you get some spare time or if you have an hour and you want to just put a little loop together. Absolutely do it. Everything that I've said today is useless without you actually putting it into action. So if you can do that, I guarantee you, you're going to be a better music producer 
every single day if you just show up. Thank you so much for sticking around and watching this Logic Pro crash course for absolute zero beginners. I think it's about time I get so many questions and comments in my email, DMs, and also on YouTube comments. I hope that this course provided some insight for you. If you liked it, please do hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and check out my more premium courses as well, because those are going to actually take you to the next level if you're trying to learn how to maybe write your own music, use things like MIDI, use different instruments, rather than just dragging and dropping in loops. But with that being said, you guys, thank you so much for sticking around. This is Tony Holiday, and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Take care.